Yes. Hello, Dr. Stanford. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you for having your talk. I'm involved in a fairly significant group, and your work comes up quite often. Uh, my question is a bit of a two-parter. First, uh, you stated that there was 700 billion new mutations per generation, correct? Uh, at a genome size of 3 billion, wouldn't we, for simplicity's sake, sticking with point mutations, have flipped every single mutation possible multiple times over? Yes. Yes, okay. basically every possible mutation that could happen in the genome has happened during our lifetime. Great. And then you stated that most mutations are in the non-selecting range. Uh, wouldn't at some point you reach an equilibrium where the deleterious mutations flip and become returned to the previous state? So um, flipping, flipping of um, back mutations are really rare. So you'd have you'd, your weight. Basically, the, the new mutations are flooding in. Back mutations are exceedingly rare events. And so it'd be just as if there was no back. There is back mutation, but it wouldn't stem the, the tide. Thank you. I wonder whether I, I got that right. Uh, you're arguing that uh, the baby differs from both parents by 100 um, nucleotides. Yeah, or, 50 from each parent. Okay. What is actually the experimental evidence for that? We do next generation sequencing and everything, so one could test that today. Is there evidence for that? Yes, so, so I think most of the data is coming from uh, parent-child trios. And um, so they're actually doing sequencing of of parent and child, and so they actually can count the mutations. There are parts of the genome where they're not countable, like in tandem repeats and things, so they make some adjustment for that. But the 100 mutations per person per generation now is widely being circulated as the actual mutation rate. What fraction is uh, neutral is debatable. Yes. So have you ever considered a situation with some invertebrate species like horseshoe crabs that have been around for um, uh, you know, a long time into the geological record. How does the species like that con uh, continue to exist? It's really a great question. Uh, Kondrashoff actually talks about that. He said um, these, these uh, lineages have a, should have a lifespan limit. And so one, one author I didn't include was um, uh, Dr. Fred Hoyle, a famous physicist. He actually was so interested in this that he spent a few years of his life looking at the mathematics of evolution. And he concluded DNA is degrading, and he said any given piece of DNA has a limited shelf life, basically. And so he envisioned aliens coming and reseeding the planet periodically to make up for all the degenerated genome. So, um, so really, it's hard to uh, imagine deep time lineages surviving unchanged like the horseshoe crab. It's really a conceptual um, hurdle. And, and it's, I think, should be acknowledged widely that how, if, 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 if current, oh, so one really interesting thing, jumping to the virus issue, is, uh, you know, we watched the H1N1 virus go from a uh, red hot pandemic to, uh, to a, a whimper to an extinction event in 90 years. Uh, there's a paper recently published that say that all RNA viruses of all different families appear to be evolutionarily young, meaning tens of thousands of years old, um, whereas you'd think that viruses would date back to millions or billions of years ago. And it, it, um, so it's really interesting. Uh, the time element is I, something I don't want to deal with. I just want to deal with the present. I'm wondering what your starting point is, because you're talking about genetic degeneration in humans. What, what is the point where you're starting from? Like, what's the point where, I'm just curious, because you have a continuity of humans coming from some ancestor that we wouldn't consider human, what is the point that you're starting from, from which So, so the starting point, that's a good happen. question. Um, basically, if we start with a population with zero mutations, there is a burn-in time where it has to reach equilibrium, where the, um, it takes time for enough genetic diversity to build up in a zero population, um, popula a zero mutation population. Um, and so there is a, a time where it's 
unrealistic, the degeneration rate is unrealistically high. Um, and so we, we acknowledge that. But we could start anywhere. So we, we could start, let's suppose that all of the human beings in the world disappeared except the people in this room. We could start and say, okay, the average fitness in this room is one. And then we're going to monitor uh, fitness, not as reproduction, because that's a circular argument. We monitor fitness by function, you know, like IQ or physical strength or things like, or longevity. Those things are um, a better way to measure it. But it's a great question, and it, it is a part of the formulation. We do start with mutations with zero. Mut uh, we start our populations with zero, and so that's a factor. But we can restart a population once uh, uh, you've reached uh, an equilibrium, a burn-in point, and we still see decline. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, I was just wondering, um, the mutational load is, as you say, is very high, but there's a lot of redundancy in the function of the human genome, and I'm just wondering if anybody has looked at it from that perspective, that there are similar functions, so maybe a, a particular mutation may take out uh, a key, one key gene, but there are uh, redundant systems that can actually take over that function. Yes, so that, that gets in a little bit into the philosophy element, because um, it looks to me, and a lot of people, like the genome is designed to be stabilized by things like diploidy or things like gene family backups or other types of redundancy. So redundancy does, in, in, in modern design, engineering design, we look at redundancy as a really good thing. Uh, and it is a good thing for our genome. And it's interesting because how do you evolve um, processes that only have long-term effects. Normally, selection can only act upon things are short. Uh, beneficial mutations have a, normally a short-term vision of where they're going, so to speak. Yeah. It's also kind of a two-part question. Uh, the first thing is about formulations from Fisher, right, and the early on population geneticists. So those are um, incredibly useful and formal, but they're also extremely simplistic. Yeah, they assume uh, as you're assuming still, like 100 years later, that fitness is just one dimensional feature and that the function of, of, uh, of selection is to increase fitness when it's, it's probably this multidimensional um, mm -hmm. um, feature and that the, the function would be of selection would be to maintain the ability to adapt mm -hmm. and not uh, increase fitness. That's, not, that's just the construct that was used mathematically to formalize this. Right. And, this will lead to the second part, which is uh, the equation should be, um, as was mentioned, for other species, um, correct? So for bacteria, for instance, and this has been studied, so this could be looked at it. If, if your predictions are right, this should be observed in bacteria populations. They should collapse after um, a little bit of, like, uh, uh, measurable amount of time in the lab because they go through a lot of generations and you can measure more accurately the distribution of mutations and uh, uh, the number of generations and even sequence everything. Um, and, and see the predictions, but that doesn't seem to happen. Okay, those are all really good points. Let's see if I can remember what they were. Uh, the first one was, um, oftentimes it's not about gain in fitness, but adaptation. Right. I totally agree. Adaptive mutations are, are real. We can document them. They, they have value, but they don't necessarily increase net, net um, information. So I look at adaptation mutations mostly as fine tuning systems. Um, and so, in a sense, adaptations let a species remain the species because the species can accommodate changing environments. Um, the second issue you brought up was multidimensional. Um, I totally agree that the typical population genetics formulas are crazily oversimplified. The reason we went to numerical simulation is we, 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 do, we call our numerical simulations uh, comprehensive because we try to consider all the variables and uh, rather than just like a lot of, uh, in the past, numerical simulations only simulate some part of evolutionary process or like, let's say, the rate of drift or the rate of uh, some, and they often have simplifying assumptions like truncation selection or no environmental variance, things like that. So to do good numerical simulations, you have to consider like 30 parameters. And they're all adjustable, 
But you can, you, so you can look at a wide range of possibilities, but you realize that you can't reduce this to a, a formula. And so I agree with that. Your last point was? Yeah, exactly that point. If you can't reduce it to a formula, you can't model realistic systems. And then when you look at systems like bacteria, um, oh, where this is bacteria. not happening, for instance. Okay. So I was talking about bacteria. Yeah. Which right. Okay, so the bacteria point. is also a good question. So I recently read a paper about reductive evolution in bacteria, and the long-term E. coli experiment also reflects this, is bacteria rapidly adapt to a new medium or a new environment. And that's really interesting. It's an it's a adaptation. They're not gaining any new function. All those experiments usually actually involve reductive evolution. For example, all of the beneficial mutations in the long-term landscape experiment were loss of function. Genes were deleted, genes were silenced, or genes, genes were downregulated. So in one case, a promoter, which is normally regulated, became an unregulated promoter. But all that is adaptive fine-tuning. There was no new information being created. And in fact, technically, as the bacteria jettisons unnecessary genes for that environment, they are actually painting themselves into a corner. They won't be able to survive in any other environment. So they become handicapped in a sense. So there's a one, another paper on reductive evolution in bacteria where they say, uh, they, they were looking at a specific bacteria, they said one third of all random deletions increased fitness. It has to do with getting rid of any genes that aren't necessary for the moment. It's very short term, uh, you know, the bacteria, it works for them short term, but if they, then when they need those genes that they've jettisoned, uh, they can't, they don't have them. So it's a, it's a down, that's even that, in my opinion, that type of adaptation is um, entropic. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for such a provocative uh, talk where you give us the thesis that uh, according to current biological paradigms, we don't exist. Um, but my question is, is um, so much of that thesis hinges on um, a, sim a simple piece of evidence that we don't have a normal distribution of deleterious and beneficial mutations. Um, and my, my question really is, how can we empirically test this when we can only look to the past and present and we actually don't know the future of mutations? A number of geneticists have tried to quantitate the actual distribution of mutations. It's actually hard to quantify the near neutrals because they're so neutral that you can't see the effect. And so there is a certain amount of uh, assumption there. Um, the, let's see, lost my train of thought. Your question was, how can we know the distribution of mutations? Sure. And so Lenski's experiment is really interesting because um, they, because they were periodically sequencing the population as it changed, they could actually determine exactly and, and they could determine when mutations arose, they could see which mutations were beneficial. Only a tiny fraction were beneficial, and they were all reductive. Mm -hmm. So there's, that's a quantitative thing. Uh, also, we, we did a, a research on the influenza virus. So Rob Carter and I, um, turns out that over the last uh, 70 years or so, uh, medical people have been freezing influenza samples. And then all those samples for, through history have, were sequenced. So we have this historical sequence, kind of like the Lenski situation, but with influenza. And what we see is that, um, well, actually, let me just show a slide here. This is our numerical simulation. Mutation goes up perfectly linearly, and fitness goes down uh, in a, with a fitness decline curve. And this is the influenza study that we did. Uh, Rob gathered uh, sequence data going back to the 30s. And what he sees is a strict linear accumulation, just in the same way. So basically, it's clock-like. 10% of the influenza, H1N1 influenza virus mutated. And um, so this is, this is genetic entropy at work. And it's, it's supported by other people who have been following H1N1's virulence, and they show that the decline over, since, since again, records were being kept, or actually since the 1918 influenza, 
uh, is that the virulence declined in the same type of way that, um, that we see in our simulations to the point where in 2009, that human version of H1N1, there's still H1N1 circulating that swine flu, but H1N1 went extinct in 2009. So that's clearly indicating that this is not neutral or adaptive. This is genetic entropy at work in a biological system where we can measure what's going on. There were mutations, by the way, there was some adaptation. There were some beneficial mutations happening, but it wasn't enough to stop extinction. And these two other curves were two other influenza outbreaks, and they similarly underwent entropic decay. Uh, I don't, they didn't go extinct yet, but they're clearly headed that way. So we do have some biological data. Okay, it's, it's, well, thank you. It's true that it's largely theoretical, but there's now growing biological data. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I really appreciate you showing up, and I know I've taken too much time. Um, I have a few books that I'm happy to share with you, uh, one genetic entropy and one on contested bones. Um, if, if you think you're going to read it, you're welcome to a copy. Um, the BINP, Biological Information, New Perspectives, that proceedings is in the NIH library, and um, you can but you don't want to read that proceedings. It would take you a few months. It's uh, 25 really long papers, very technical, on all the different dimensions to biological information. But there's a, like a synopsis you can read in a few hours, which is freely available at binp.org. It stands for Biological Information New Perspectives.org. Uh, and there you can download the synopsis for free. So if that interests you, that's available. But uh, thank you so much for your patience. <laughs>